forget what you've heard about Vietnam. Let's find out what it's really like. Imagine an economy that, in the span of a few decades, catapulted from one of the poorest in Asia to a growth rate of 8.02% in 2022, outpacing even the giants of India and China. This isn't a hypothetical scenario. It's the reality of Vietnam. With a GDP per capita that increased nearly tenfold from under $300 in the 1980s to $2,800 in 2020. What's up there, youngster? So it is the Curtis Mayfield of expat relocation coming to you from Bangkok, Thailand at the moment. Well, I wouldn't call it radical. Um, I just spoke my mind. And I'm here with Big Uncle Hollywood. He's in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And uh, guys, you know, we, we, we check on what the viewers ask about. And like a lot of our viewers on YouTube, one of the top things they search is what is life like? for an English teacher in Vietnam, right? So, because we have a lot of content on teaching in Vietnam because that's how I started my business in Southeast Asia was teaching English, making connections in HR, which eventually made me lead to making connections with people who did immigration services, and kind of just learning how the Vietnamese work. And then, it, you know, a lot of, you know, things happened with the pandemic and it put me in a position where I was able to build stronger relationships and help foreigners get into Vietnam because at the time, uh, a Vietnamese were allowing foreigners in if they were experts and English teachers were considered experts. <laughs> and here I am, a guy getting people jobs as English teachers. So Vietnam was very good. It helped me build something in my life, put me in the right place at the right time. Uh, it changed my life. It changed how I look at the world. Um, so I'll weigh in based on about six years in Vietnam, five of which teaching, uh, one pretty much just fucking around and uh, running a, my own business and, you know, doing self-supporting basically, right? Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll talk to Big Uncle over here who is now, how long you been over there now, Big Uncle? Four and a half years. Okay, and that's been teaching, uh, the whole, teaching. The whole. I've been teaching, I got. I got off the plane and started teaching two weeks later. You got me work. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I got and off, been... boom, right, worked ever since nonstop. And we've been friends uh, for years. It's crazy. Well, you know, figuring I talked to you before I even came to Vietnam when I started watching your crazy ass uh, YouTube channel. I'm like, if this bozo can do it, I can do it. You know, oh, yeah, no doubt, <laughs> no, no and, doubt, bro. But but you're not a bozo. I tell you, you know, I'm just using it as an example. You actually <laughs> got the shit down in uh, Vietnam and all around. So once again, I got yeah. an apartment to you. I got a job because of you and I'm not throwing, you know, shit your way. I'm just being honest. Oh, I know, dude. I'm and from New York. I'm not sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> And since then, we also chill and I go visit you. You come here back. I go hang, you know, with buddies, brothers, you know. So, yeah, I, mean, uh, I really and like we were we were just like started as a business relationship. And now pretty much I'll do anything for Hollywood. Like, you know, and that's it's kind of how it works working with us guys. You know, um, we, we try to have more of like a relationship with the clients. And honestly, eventually, if they're if everything goes well, hopefully a friendship, you know, and. Uh, that I, I wanted to to basically steer it back to the conversation about how Hollywood is a teacher from the minute he got into the country. I appreciate the heartfelt sentiment about us getting him set up. And, you know, we get that a lot, guys. People really appreciate a new chance at life. And honestly, Vietnam can give you a new chance at life, but it depends a lot on how you are as a person and like what your priorities are and how flexible you are. So I came up with a couple talking points today, guys, that I thought would be interesting for someone who is thinking about what life is like in Vietnam. And I'm going to weigh in a little bit on what I think about it. And we're going to have Hollywood. He's going to weigh in a little bit what he thinks about it. So I'd say the first one is cultural immersion. You are going to be in Vietnam. This is not the idea of you being in Vietnam. This is you are in Vietnam. And if you're in Sa Saigon, you're in a city the size of almost not quite New York, but almost New York with with like nearly no infrastructure. 
So you're going to be in a very different world. It's going to be a different mindset. Uh, what would you say about that? What would you say about the cultural immersion, the good stuff and the bad stuff? Uh, I mean, for teaching wise, a lot of cultural yeah. things that you would do in your country, uh, for instance, as a teacher, sometimes you might lean on your desk or sit on the corner of your desk and maybe you don't do that here. Um, you know, it, it's more of a, they all wear uniforms. They can't have pierced earrings in their upper ear. You know, you, it, it's, they can't eat in the classroom. You know, they're very strict with their rules here. Whereas in, you know, America, uh, it's almost like the kids control the classes. Uh, so that, you know, just every day you, I, I'm, I'm here four years. I'm still learning cultural stuff all the time. Um, I, so, you know, it's just learn the basics. And if you're going to teach here, uh, try to pick up uh, a few of the cultural things so when you're in class they don't kind of talk about you or laugh at you or you get yelled at by somebody who is very very into the don't the rule some, some teachers are like okay you i understand you're a foreigner some teachers are like no and then they can call your center and it could be over for you so those are the basic classroom one would be don't sit on your desk and uh, make sure they follow the rules before the class. Uh, and as far as a uh, good thing, I think it's all good. It's a lot of happiness and peacefulness and, you know, there it's good times. Uh, you're not stressing about crime over, you know, I've been here four and a half years. Uh, I got my phone stolen the third week here. Uh, and that was the last time anything happened. And I was coming home late at night. It was probably my fault putting in my back pocket. So as far as cultural stuff, I mean, you don't have to worry about crime as much. You don't have to worry about the little stupid things that they bother you for, you know, in other countries. I would agree with that. I would say um, there is a certain level of just freedom that you experience, especially as a foreigner, because you're so you're in the society, but you're not in the society, right? So you're existing at this different level. You have the U.S. passport, so that opens doors for you. It gives you access to people who are higher in the society. So you will tend to get more of the good side of the culture, you know? Um, I think where foreigners encounter a lot of trouble around culture is around understanding uh, the Vietnamese intentions and business. And like a lot of times, not, you know, they'll read something that's not a scam as a scam when really it's like an issue of saving face or an issue of like not wanting to tell you, you know, like, like a lot of times the Vietnamese, you know, it's not necessarily that they're scamming. It's that a lot of them are working like hella hours. They're working too. And then they're hustling also on top of whatever they're doing, you yeah, know, no, and they're, you... yeah, they're on a different level of, gr of grind. You know, you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, you could just tell, you know, they'll get up at eight in the morning. They're going to work till about 10 at night and anything in the middle, they're going to try to make extra because they don't really make too much money, you know, so they need to make every penny they can. I mean, like, like in America, can I pay you tomorrow? There's no really paying you tomorrow here. You've got to pay them now. Uh, you know, it, it's so, yeah, I would say that would be a, a big Big thing right there. It, it's different. People, and there are people who are, are so set up and so wealthy, especially in like Saigon or Hanoi or other parts of the country that have some wealth. Um, you know, and the, but that's not necessarily everybody. A lot of people, who, especially at like training centers that are kind of in the lower quality, you're going to be more in the culture, like, or in the public schools that are kind of more in the lower end of the, of the public schools. You're going to be much more in the culture, whereas for a while I was teaching at a public school that was like a lot of I think I think a lot of government people's kids went to. It was in District One. Uh, and it had air conditioning. And back in the day, having air conditioning was like this luxury. 
you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the kids were all pretty good, but I was still a degenerate and I would not get up at like, uh, any time before like 11 o'clock. I think, I think my school teaching schedule started at like 1 PM or <laughs> something like this. The normal hour start time in the afternoon, 1 30, Yeah, it was something like that. And then I would shoot over and, you know, I, and I, they tried to get me to come to a parent teacher conference thing. And I had a rule, you know, that white monkey doesn't get up in the mornings, you know, <laughs> you know? so, they, you know, I made them schedule this whole event. I told them, put together the presentation and I'll just stand there and I'll pretend that I'm teaching it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and she can do the fucking speech and they can have it, right? Funny, so funny. I, I had a, As you know, uh, I work for a company and I do uh, substituting all over Saigon. Like last week, I did four different schools in four different districts. And one of the schools I went to, normally you get a, a 45 minute break. They made me, well, not made me, but I really didn't have a choice. They put us, they brought me in the middle of the playground with a chair and they put a board behind me and it said, <laughs> talk to the partner. And all I swear to God. And I sat down and like 300 kids rushed me. I was like, they were up the back. Where are you from? What are you doing? <laughs> I was like, I'm you here. and you. Now that's a white monkey. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. Thank you and you. Oh, yeah, a lot of kids will just a lot of the, you got to understand a lot of people in Vietnam, the English isn't spectacular compared to the rest of Southeast Asia, even guys like, you know, here in Thailand, I think probably they speak less English than Cambodia. Cambodia probably speaks the most English around this area. And then south of here, like, you know, English is pretty good in Malaysia and Singapore, obviously. And uh, also English is actually fairly good in the Philippines, like. That's why a lot of American expats end up there. But Vietnam, English is not fantastic, right? So a lot of times you'll have people who just come up to you and they'll just say the things they know how to say to you. Like, hello, I'm fine, thank you, and you? How old are you? I am married. I have a child. Do you have a child? You know, and it's like, okay, cool. You, I do it back to them, but I do it in Vietnamese. So I practice my Vietnamese with them. And I try to say words back to them in Vietnamese when I was doing it. I mean, honestly, I mean, guys, it's it's different culture, but it's still pretty good. It's, it's okay. It, it's polluted as fuck, but you can do whatever you want, basically, like within reason, you know, like. Can I bring up one point? Just, uh, yeah, you yeah. know, like if you, a little bit of Vietnamese, uh, oh, they, you know, but I don't really know too much. So I'm just used, sometimes I go up, I don't think about it. I say, hello, and they go, no, xin chào, xin chào. And then their phone rings, and they go, hello. <laughs> Why can't I say yeah. hello? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Say hello. Why do I got to say chào? Because they want to laugh at yeah. the partner when they say that. I just, yeah, I just thought that yeah. was I, I try. I try. And my Vietnamese is OK. Like I can get around, man. I was in a, a cannabis mall here in Bangkok and I went into it, to the fucking cannabis shopping mall to film for content. And there was uh, the Thai guys were listening to New York hardcore, like Mad Ball and shit. And I was like, oh, my God, bro, like I'm from New York. And, uh, you know, whatever, I bought a joint off them. I shot the video and they're like, oh, one of the bud tenders down here is from Vietnam. So I went over to her and I just said, hello in Vietnamese. How are you? Blah, blah, blah. And she understood me fully even still. So, I mean, I guess it depends. Like, I'm not going to command a university lecture. I'm not going to like <laughs> command a business meeting, you know, but I can get the, the I can get the taxi guy to laugh. I can get, you know, like. Yeah. So it's not so bad to know some of the language. I, in Thailand, I know a bit less Thai than Vietnamese, but I still know some Thai. And I, I can do numbers and get around. And like it's it takes time, guys. It's hard to learn a, a, a different language that sounds nothing like your language. But, you know, if you really want to, you can learn some. And I'm sure you know some now, too, bro. Like I under I, I understand more than I can say, but I know how to say money and hello, goodbye, how, you know, things of that nature where they're a little bit more nicer to you. I remember we went out one night and we went to get a smoothie and the lady was like getting angry. This is when I first got here. 
because she couldn't understand what I said. And then you said it in uh, Vietnamese. And uh, she, oh, and she got so yeah, much yeah, nice. Yeah. It definitely does matter if you're going to be here. Of course. Basic yeah, it's stuff. It's good. I mean, Vietnamese is hard. I've been to 45 countries. It's one of the hardest mm-hmm. languages I've come across. Because when you speak in English, you'll say like one word. But if you say it in Vietnamese, it's like four words. But they reverse the words. So that's why sometimes when they speak to you here, it's almost like you have to. It's good I have dyslexia. (laughs) And and there's like. And the the thing is, like, that I found that's really difficult is there's like words that are added that have no meaning. They're just meant to make the the sentence more balanced. So like for, you know. Nah, you could put at the end yeah. exactly, 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 right? And there's and and like then sometimes it's it's also like you said it's backwards, so it's like not like do you like her? It's like do you you like her? Do you not? You know that makes it a little harder, you know. But uh, you know it's the tones for me because Kamai and Thai are not to- as tonal. Well, Thai is tonal, but the ties can infer meaning better. So like I can the ties understand my Thai much faster. Than in Vietnam, and I think I speak way more Vietnamese. Uh, but let's get on to the next uh, the next topic that I think is kind of important, uh, and this is also going to be something that's relevant to you, because the nature of this video is for teachers, right? So teaching opportunities. I would say Vietnam has a lot of teaching opportunities, whether you have a degree, no degree, a master's degree, a licensed teacher. I think even a person looking to open up an education business, but you need money for that, guys. Don't I can do it for you, but you need dough uh, if you want to own your own shit. But I, I, I don't that's know, man. To me, education. Go. That's make the money to open up your own center. This way, you get a hundred kids, and you're charging them four million a month. You know that. You know that's just a, a basic way of it. But that's where your money's at. I always thought about doing that. But you, as an American, it's a lot of money to get going. And you need a Vietnamese per- partner, so you got to be able to trust them. But that would be the way to go, make money, open your own school. Oh, if, if, if you have a Vietnamese partner, you don't need as much money. I mean, you could you could do it through your Vietnamese partner, but you better trust that person a lot. And, you know, right, right. You, you know, they're <laughs> they're going to have more ownership. I mean, foreigners can own an education business in Vietnam. The thing is, is that they have to – they have to pay quite a bit of money because there's it's a protected industry. It's like the same as like a guest house. Like if you wanted to do something in tourism in Vietnam, it's a protected industry. So it's quite expensive for someone as a foreigner. And there's a lot of compliance and there's also a lot of compliance at the local level. So there's going to be dealing with the, the local authorities as well as dealing with like the 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 main taxation departments around running businesses like it's it's going to be a very hands-on experience with the Vietnamese government depending on where you choose to operate um but in Saigon I feel like with education whether it's running your own business or just being employed I think that's something that's like here to stay there's a lot of centers there's a lot of schools I mean uh, <laughs> once again you know since I work for the company you introduced me to now uh, a new one and I do substituting all over. I mean, I'm fine. I'm seeing these schools and these little hems. Like, where? How, do, how does this school even exist? Mm-hmm. You know. Yesterday, I worked in a, a school that was like an apartment building. I to get to the grade five, I had to go up, walk up five flights of stairs. They're on grade, you know. So you're <laughs> finding all, and I'm getting some. I get lucky. I get some good schools with aircon, and the kids are smarter than my grade eleven classes. You know, if they're younger. And then the other day, I got a class where there were 50 kids, and they put you in an auditorium on the top floor with the sun beaming in, no air. I felt like I was going to pass out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, they no, say, feel it. They don't have books, so you have to bring your computer. They don't, they don't, the kids don't have books. So I bring my computer. Do you have Wi-Fi? No. Well, then why do I have to bring my computer? How do these kids learn? There's no Wi-Fi, no books. Well, they just want to hear you talk. I can do that. <laughs> so for those of you who are unsure, uh, Uncle Hollywood works in the public school system. <laughs> so I got, like myself, like like I, I was a vet- I was as well an alumni of the Ho Chi Minh City public school system. <laughs> Which I think is better, though. I mean, you'll make more money in the other, you know, in the international schools. But I 
prefer the public school, be honest with you. Uh, agree, agree. I, I don't want responsibilities. <laughs> go in, go out. International, they want you to sit in the office, do do your lesson planning. and mm-hmm. yeah. So you make a lot more money and you're in a comfortable school with air con. The kids are smart. You know, the other day, grade 11, I asked the kid, what country are you from? He said, China. She said China? I said, so what language do you speak? China. I had another kid the other day. He's probably Chinese Vietnamese. Hold on, I got one more. The other kid, this is what you're dealing with. Uh, Grade 12. Uh, We were talking about fast food restaurants, and his favorite was MC Donald's. Good one. 12th grade? MC Donald's. MC Donald's. So that's what you're kind of dealing with. (laughs) You'll get some classes where you'll have, like, everybody's super good, and and even if they don't speak English, they're, like, legit nice kids, and they're trying. And then you'll have, like, other ones where it's just – fucking nobody speaks English. It's like, these kids are 16, nobody speaks English, nobody's gonna speak English, it's not gonna change tomorrow. <laughs> like, no. like, even if they see the white face, see the white face for an hour a week, you know? <laughs> like, and, and you're the only teacher in the class, I, like, I don't even have a uh, teacher aide in my grade uh, 10 and 11 classes in District 10. No yeah. teacher to have. <laughs> no aid. They don't know is I just taught them the alphabet. <laughs> and then the other day, I was in a real school, grade three. Mm. The kid was on, he knew what planet he was on. These kids in 12th, yeah, 11th yeah. grade don't even know what planet they live on. They have no common sense. They're just on mm. their phone all the time. It's ridiculous. I had, I had some classes, like, over the years where... Like some of the kids, like you're looking at them and like, man, I have real hope for the future of this country. These kids are great. And then I'd have like the next bunch and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I don't, I used to think like, you know, do they segregate them by behavior? I mean, I assume they do by academic performance for sure. I've taught every grade from kindergarten to grade 12. I taught a college class. I've taught night schools for adults. Um, you can teach a kid in second grade, you know, A, a is A, and then mm-hmm. one time, remember, and then a kid in grade 11, you can go A a billion times and he won't remember. Uh, right. I don't think, the, right. I just think it has to do with it. They, they, they believe that they're not going to need this when they get older. They're going to be mm-hmm. a mechanic worker on why do I need to, so they want to chill out in class. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, yeah. Then but then, like the I said, there's the the other side of it, the ones where the whole class is like, these kids are so dedicated and they're good kids. And you're like, damn, like it depends on the school and your district, you know, mm-hmm. like the one school, they didn't even have books for the kids. I mean, how do you really no, learn? Yeah. With, you know, I never had a book not, either, though. Well, it's good to have the book because when I go substitute, I have no idea what I'm walking into. They give me a a message that's too big for my phone to open. So I just go to class and I say, uh, I substitute today, uh, what page? And then normally I've done it for four years. I, I know, you know, now I know the yeah, books. Yeah, you know the I books, can, yeah. <laughs> you know, the first five minutes is, I because I'm new, I introduce my name, but I play hangman for my name. Yeah. yeah. So guess my name and we'll do hangman. And, that, and it's right there. And then where that's am good. I from? And then how old am I? And by that time, 15 minutes is up. And then open the page and I leave and I never go back to school. I was far far more disinterested. Like I would show up, I would read whatever the page was in the book. I would sit down and I'd pick the one boy, one girl and say, who wants the power? Okay. So we get one boy, one girl. You pick the teams, you pick the words, you pick the games. Teacher's going to sit over here and put his fucking feet up. You know, and that's pretty much what I did every day for like five years, basically. <laughs> Mostly primary, though. The, I think the older kids would have really, really resented me. <laughs> yeah, you could do that in public school, in national school, and you get away with that. No, 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 no. Even in a, even in a, the training centers, the, some of the corporate ones. Which guys, listen, 
I, I can get you jobs at these big corporate training centers, like the ones that are all well recognized in Vietnam, but I just don't recommend it, man. Like everybody I know who's done these corporate or these, uh, these kind of uh, international school environments, unless that's really what they want to do and they just have money, they they want they want to have the the money and the security that that provides. <clears throat> uh, I get it, so I don't fault anybody, and I can help you if you want those kind of jobs too. But if you don't need that kind of job and you're just trying to satisfy a visa or something, uh, the public school thing is a great way to do it. Uh, the the smaller to medium sized training centers. And then what I would do is just develop my own group classes. But let's get to the next one. Let's move along a little bit and see some of the other talking points I came up with today. Uh, affordable living. I would say that's an important one. Well, it depends on your lifestyle. I mean, uh, uh, for me, I, I try to save as much money so I could travel around or go out at night. And if I want to go to a rooftop bar, I go rooftop because they're a little bit more expensive. I was uh, paying... To, with aircon, with Wi-Fi, with cable, with water, with motorbike parking, fifth floor, I was paying two hundred seventy dollars a month for like a studio. Um, but I mean, you had uh, an okay I, view. Yeah, you had yeah, an okay yeah. little view. Yeah, had a good view and nice area, quiet. No chickens, no roosters. You know, no construction. Construction was really the only thing that was there was a, a company that made ice, so all night ice was being made. But you know, you don't barely hear that. Uh, but then it, you could go up, and I met a dude, twenty million a month, penthouse, you know, right off the main road, main uh, main road by the opera house, and was that District Three? Yeah, yeah. District Three oh. is uh, the District Three is by War Museum, so District One would be Opera House. Four. Yeah, so, you know, but if you're going to work in, and it depends, you want to travel. So if you're going to just use this as a base, you know, because as a teacher here, you get a lot of days off. Uh, if you work in international school, normally you get paid for them. Uh, public schools, normally you do not get paid for them, you know, and you still have to save some money for the summer because, there's, you know, you're not going to make money in the summer unless you work at a center or tutor rep, tutor. So you do have to save some money to live for the summer unless you just travel for the two months in the summer and come back. But it really depends on how you want to live and your lifestyle. Uh, I want I want to save money and travel. I don't care about how nice my place looks. I'm never in it. <laughs> I'm working all day, all afternoon. And then I'll usually go out at night and have uh, some... Uh, what, how do you say, kumga, kumga, chicken and rice, rice and kumga, chicken. chicken and rice, yeah, bro, I feel you. Fried chicken, uh, okay. chicken fried. See, in America, you would say fried chicken here, they say chicken fried. Well, you know, we get the kum jai, kum jai, vegetarian food, the, ve the vegan it. food. We're not, we're, we're not vegan, though. I eat eggs and shit, and I, you know, seafood. You in Thailand, it's perfect. You eat scorpions, yeah. too. I eat scorpions too, clearly. You know? <laughs> I'm just not a big fan of eating things I'm related to. I don't mind eating things I'm not so related to, like aliens and shit. That's different, you know? But um, <laughs> all right. So let's, so I would say to add to that, uh, Uncle lives outside of the city center for, for that type of uh, spread that he has, and it's a very good deal. Uh, but the area is more dusty and more crowded and uh, compared to, like, if you were to live in District 2 or, in the, or District 1 in the center – uh, District one is more set up for foreigners, like walkable. Uh, if I <clears throat> if I was going to go back to teach, I would probably try to position myself to live in either District one or Binton, just because depending on the time of the year that you get there, you may not have like the option of picking where your schools are going to be. So if you're just like looking to live on like a public school kind of thing, being central to as many places where you can pick up hours is pretty ideal. Um, but you can also adjust once you have more of a fixed schedule or if you start the year in the beginning of the year and you have a good choice of your schedule first, you might be able to kind of, you know, pick schools closer to where you're living and get set up like that. What works good. Because I was so close to school. That's the worst part of teaching in Vietnam is you get so many breaks that if you live far, you're going to spend so much money at cafes and eat in and, you know, but if you live close uh, and, and it rains a lot, so you don't want to be too far away from everything. 
Um, so that's if you know where you're going to work before you get here, you want to live across the street from the school if you can. Yeah, so, yeah. If you don't know uh, where you're working, I suggest maybe an Airbnb for two months until you figure out where you're working. You know, and then uh, if, if they work with us, we can put them in. Uh, we can put them in a guest house. We have a guest house in District Three, City Center, clean, safe. You've been there many times. <clears throat> but if you're gonna come in and say, "Oh, I'm gonna get a job," and then you end up working in District Ten or Twelve, and you're in, uh, you know, <laughs> District One, that, that's 45 minutes. Or District Seven, 45 minutes from Tan Bin and Bin and Hunan and Tan Fu. Uh, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. Uh, you know, that that's a far ride, especially if it's raining or you get out at mm -hmm. five o'clock school and a lot of traffic. That's a two hour commute, maybe hour and a half. And this so. is this is the truth for whether or not you're working for an, an international school or a public school, because, hey, maybe you work for an international school that's out in like, you know, District nine, like one of those big ass ones on the way out to Vung Tao, Right. And then, you know, you happen to decide, oh, well, I want to live near District 1. Well, good luck with your fucking commute every day. I mean, so you do, it's not it's not something you can be super lackadaisical about. So starting in the center is a fairly good tip until you kind of know where you're going to go. And like he was saying, if you want to grab an Airbnb, if you're not working with us, I would probably say Airbnb, booking, uh, you know, you can try to find accommodation like that. Uh, accommodation, believe it or not, can be somewhat more expensive than you might expect it to be, especially in District 1 or in the center of Saigon. And uh, you don't always get a good quality for what you pay. So it's, it is kind of important to know like the specific spots. Uh, that's why people who work with us, we put them through a lady that we have that I used to live with and that I trust completely. She's like a really nice lady. Uh, the place got a rooftop. It's in the middle of the city center. Uh, but well, all, mm, mm. I met her twice already. Very nice. Yeah, she got one bedroom. She got studios. And she does short term and long term with no lease requirement. So she can do month to month. See, this is the thing. A lot of places in Saigon will try to get three months out of you minimum, you know, uh, especially around District 1 in that area. So, guys, you know, you can definitely do it, though. Uh, Airbnb, you're going to pay anywhere from 100 to 200 more. And I had a really shitty Airbnb experience out in District 2. It was a fucking horrendous joke. And I went to war with these people. And that, that shit box of a fucking apartment that they're trying to make look chic, you know? Um, you know, fucking see-through bathroom. So when you're taking a dump, you can, like, look at your wife. <laughs> hey, honey, how's, how's dinner going? <laughs> Yeah, it's a dirt bag shit. Yeah, but I don't know. So I guess there's a, you know, that's, that's again, why I sometimes, I think what I do is actually fairly like a good, th fairly good service, guys. Anyway, let's go on. All right. So community connections. Yourself. It's not fairly good. It is a good service. Better than Thank the you. other ones. I know a lot of people here that have been ripped off. And Thank you. I mean, you don't have over 100 people that you've helped. Or more at this point. More, more at this point. Your your shit is, uh, your stuff is legit. Don't, so don't under talk to yourself. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, if you thank you, man. If you, I mean, if yeah, if you want to come out here, guys, like, I just my my mindset about this whole thing and about this business is if I can make money helping people who like were like me and kind of in the dark and kind of didn't understand how the world worked. Uh, if I can help them improve their standard of living, then that's great. You know, um, my my service is largely targeted towards people in Western countries, though, guys, like it's very difficult to rock up to Vietnam if you don't have a passport from like the US, UK, Australia and have the same experiences that myself and that Hollywood have had. Uh, you know, it's very, very different for non-native speakers, uh, although if you're a European citizen, you know, it, it's going to still be a, l a little bit more complicated because you're considered non-native, but it's still going to be very easy to get you a job. Uh, for the most part, white South Africans, we can get them jobs. Very hard to get anyone from an African country a job. Not, almost none of the recruiters I know are willing to hire from those countries. Not really willing to hire from Bangladesh. Uh, although Indian, Filipino, and other SEA countries, uh, if you, I mean, listen, if you can afford my service, I've been able to help people from all those countries find jobs in teaching in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's just something to do with the local perception of those nationalities, and it's a little bit easier for them, I guess, in terms of work permits and things like that. 
So yeah, I can sometimes find jobs for people from those nationalities, but generally speaking, the services priced towards Western teachers because the TEFL industry in the US or in Europe or in Western, you know, English speaking countries like Australia, Canada, uh, you know, these things are accredited by these companies, these things called like accrediting bodies, but you can just buy an accrediting body. So literally I could just open up my TEFL and, and then hire an accrediting body by paying them some money. And now my they TEFL know. is accredited. <laughs> they just look at your TEFL. They don't know who it's from. They just want yeah, the so these form. Just get the cheapest one. Everybody's sure yeah. should I get the hours? I mean, it, my TEFL was 150 hours. It was 25 bucks. I mean, so I spent an extra $3 for the extra hours because I didn't have Me a spent nine. Me spent huh? $9. Yeah, cheap ones out there. Yeah, it don't matter what it's for. Just get it. Yeah, yeah no, my wife spent $9, guys. So and I'm still mad about that because I bought a Tuffle years ago before I moved to Asia and before, and I paid like 300 bucks. But it was like so stupid. It's the stupidest oh, thing. Really? I didn't know. I would, yeah, New Zealand. When I, I, hadn't li I hadn't lived in Asia. I'd been to Asia, but I hadn't lived in Asia. So I didn't understand like... You know, especially the, in a communist country about the box tick concept, you know, like <laughs> check the box. Tick, yeah. tick, check, tick, tick, yeah. Got check. tick, the, yeah, tick the box, tick the box. Tick the box. Yeah. So, tick the box. so, so yeah, guys, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's a different mindset. And again, we talked about cultural immersion a little bit earlier, and that's, you're going to get a different mindset on employment. You're going to get a different mindset on business. You're going to get a different mindset on relationships, on friendships, on what's publicly acceptable behavior. Uh, you know, it's just, it's going to be very different. So what I do is I just try to like always smile and it like tricks my brain and, you know, it's a Buddhist country and I, I'm already kind of like in awe of everything I'm seeing, even though it's funny, man, I've lived out here now for Southeast Asia, like I've been out of America for around 11 years, maybe Southeast Asia for about seven or eight years, including like time in Vietnam, Cambodia, you know, Thailand, you know, Malaysia, other places. Right. Uh, and I still sometimes take a step back and I'm like, this is amazing. You know? Well, I mean, when I was in America, I had my own business. I had, I had my own fitness company. I was, you know, my background has always been into fitness uh, on my YouTube channel, Highwoods Journey, you can go and watch them. I, I applied for American Ninja Warrior. I was into fitness, but I was working so many hours and getting older. And I'm like, I got to switch it up. And then I heard about teaching. I seen your video. And matter of fact, that's why I got my Teflon for uh, 25 because you said, don't waste any money. Get the cheapest one. Uh, and, uh, you know, you don't make... Like in America, if you make let's say twenty five hundred a month, here you might make eighteen hundred. Don't think of that as I'm losing money because life is so much cheaper here. You know, you get an apartment for four or five hundred dollars, you're living in a nice place. You know, so I mean, in America, it would cost you two, three thousand dollars for a month for a place like that. So right off the bat, your cost of living saves you money and then the food and the clothes and you're traveling around i mean you're still saving money so don't be afraid no and you make you make enough especially if you're willing to like mostly work and not drink a lot <clears throat> uh saigon is is a rough city it can be a rough city to live in it's not great for your health but to be honest none of these cities are you know super great for your health i mean southeast America asia is developing guys you know America's not great for your health, man. Not with pollution. No, well, <laughs> it, it depends on your situation in America. Like, for if you're trying to work and you're, like, working as a teacher, then it's, like, a no-brainer. You need to come over to Southeast Asia. You're going to get treated a lot better. Like, not life-changing better that the pollution won't matter. If you're at the right. bottom in America and you're, you're working at, like, fucking fries and shit, then absolutely. Vietnam, the pollution's not going to matter. But if you're, like, an established homeowner who has a house in Palm Beach... I would probably try to get you go more towards Europe or towards certain destinations yeah. in Latin America than I would towards Southeast Asia and towards teaching English or anything to do with that. <clears throat> but for people who just want to get started or entrepreneurs and they're trying to raise capital to get a business going or do something, you could do far worse than teaching English. I mean, you'll save a little bit of money. You get to eat good food. You have a good standard of living. 
and you get to be social. Uh, you know, it, Saigon is very dynamic. Uh, other parts of the country, the provinces. I mean, if you have documents, I mean, I don't recommend the provinces a lot, guys, unless you've lived in Vietnam for a long time and you're really kind of into the cult, like living in the culture and you know the culture, because a lot of stuff in the provinces can be almost like little kingdoms where like you can have like local authority is very well connected to the training center you work for. And like the training center is cool. It's not a big problem. But if it, they're not cool, then they could try to make trouble for you. And you see these stories, especially people coming from Africa who get their passports taken away. They tell them shit like, oh, your kids are going to get to go to school. And then they get out there and like your kids can't go to school, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you know, and then they take their passports and you see them on the Hanoi, especially the, in the north, you know. Uh, but in the South, it's not as gangster necessarily with the foreigners. It can be, but it's it's less so than in the North. Uh, but it's still provincial, and you're going to still have a provincial mindset. Whereas if you start off in the larger urban areas, like even in the North, like Hanoi versus a, a northern province, you're going to do better in population centers that are a little more accustomed to foreigners. There's maybe a bit more high level of education amongst the local people. So, you know, you do have to kind of like bear that in mind. And if you are... Like even a, a you know a well paid international school teacher, there's areas of Saigon where you can have a suburban lifestyle if if that's what you're looking for. What's good about it is you can have whatever lifestyle you want. You know, in in other countries, you got to work your tail off just to live. Here, you, you know, you're working a lot less, and it's a lot less stressful. So I, you know, as much as uh, pollution. Uh, stress is probably one of the le most leading causes of, of sickness in the world. People stress, mm. you get hard, you know, sick all the time, depressed, you know. So, you know, you, you take the pollution, but being in other countries where you got to work 150 hours uh, a month or 170 hours a month, where here you can work 190, 80 hours a month. And you're still living nice, it's, and you can make your own lifestyle. I eat clean. I consume matcha. I consume all kinds of healthy teas. Uh, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of things about Asia that are very cool. You know, and like you can have a healthy lifestyle here. Uh, and it, you know, it depends also like how much Western food you want to eat. Do you want to eat mostly local food, or do you want to eat Western food where things could get very expensive? Do you want to cook at home? I have been using an air fryer here in Bangkok, and let me tell you, buy one. They are fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah, they are anything. awesome. So anyway, anything. guys, I want to get on to the next to the next one. Okay, so my my final talking point that I thought about was adventures and challenges. Right, Vietnam is a complicated fucking place, but that also creates crazy memories and crazy opportunities for you to be interacting with locals in a way that would be a lot harder for you to do in like Bangkok or Chiang Mai or, you know, you're right up in the culture, man. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, every day is an adventure. Everything I learned, it's like you learn something new every day, a new word, uh, a, you, you grab by take you a different route, you see something new every day. So every day for me is an adventure. That's why on my videos on my YouTube channel, Hollywood's Journey, I got videos of me just cruising around the city and walking around because you never know what you're going to see. The other day, I seen a lady shitting by the bus stop. I mean... Where? Where? In Tan Phu? <laughs> uh, Tan Bin. Tan Bin. I was on my way to school. And the lady wasn't even hiding, man. Drawers drop. Final dropping. <laughs> Uh, you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> not every a lot day, of, not a, but every day's a challenge too sometimes, you know, like you know it, it, the work you're doing is you're a teacher, but it's mindless. Um, if that makes sense. You just <laughs> read that the book. So yeah, I mean is. a fucking I robot could do it. <laughs> If you can deal with that, you're okay. I mean, other than that, I mean, I don't, it's pretty simple, man. You go, you do two classes, you have a 40 minute break, 45 minute break, you do two more classes, you go home for lunch for two hours, repeat, you know, 1.30, you're done at 4.30, 5 o'clock, and then the rest of the day is yours. Like, I don't even work on Fridays. I mean, uh, you make your own schedule. I mean, the... So I, I, every day is an adventure and every day is a challenge. 
but that's what makes life exciting. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I'm not worried about what I say because once they, one, they don't probably understand me, and two, I don't have any woke people, you know, no, complaining <laughs> or don't worry about that little stuff here, man. Life, you know, it's a challenge and it's an adventure all in one, and that's what I love about it. And I make my own schedule, and I make enough money where I can travel and still save a little bit. So. Really? Yeah, people in the the woke, the woke thing, you might get some individual like teachers, and that's why international schools might be less pleasant because you might get international schools where people come from like academia and they're narcissistic to begin with, and now they run an, interna an international school, so they're going to try to control you and blah blah blah. And this is and you know put their ideology on you. But honestly, in the public school system, they just want you to show up sober, do your job, you know, not piss anybody off. It's more about making the kids like you and the, and the TA like you than it is about teaching them anything, because you have yeah. situations where there's 50, 50, 60 kids in a class. The chances of you being able to teach these kids anything is like almost fucking zero. So when you try right. to force them into like rigorous academic activity, you're just going to get everyone's going to hate you. So like you have to understand what your role is, especially, you know, there are classes where the kids will benefit from some things that the teacher will generally tell you or they'll tell you if they're organized well. Uh, and then there's other classes where you just kind of need to let go. But I used to see these guys get all red and worked up and fucking about to have a heart attack. And it's like, bro. You need to calm the fuck down. Like, what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to change Vietnam? <laughs> like, you seriously? Think, it's not the West, you know? In the beginning, you feel like that a little bit because it's new. You're not sure how to react because it can get crazy, man. It can, yeah, yeah. It, it can get crazy in there. Oh, yeah. It can get bonkers in there. I mean, oh, yeah. I seen I seen a kid drop another kid with an elbow. He just walked in, said "Hello, teacher," and went like, "Bam!" to this other kid's grill. <laughs> yeah, yesterday, uh, Thursday, I'm in uh, Bintan uh, teaching uh, third grade. I thought I was I was teaching the Warriors from the movie. They were just like they have fake switchblade knives and they're. They're doing this, and then one kid come up, said something, the other kid popped him. I was waiting for the, for, you know, the greasers to come out from the outsiders. I was like, where am I? This is like yeah, gambling. Yeah, yeah. And they're third yeah, grade. Yeah. They're teachers, teachers in the back on the phone. Oh my God. Oh. Well, the, I love the TAs who are like, they're like, they're doing something, but they're not that interested. So they just kind of <laughs> walk around with the megaphone. <laughs> Yelling yeah. at him, and and it like it's super random. Like some kids just sitting there, and all of a sudden she's like hitting the desk. It's like what the fuck? But like, that's not even the problem. The kid's not doing and, nothing. Like and they take together like forty four rulers. So when they hit the table, the desk, the uh, like uh, like a, it's a four point eight magnitude earthquake, and you're like the kids like pee in their pants. I mean, it, it, and then they well, complain about. Well, the, it. <laughs> Or the TAs uh, who who would the TAs who would make me do their university check their university papers while they make the kids yeah. shut up. <laughs> Everybody yep. shut the fuck up. <laughs> I had that in HVC. I felt like I was in Shawshank Redemption, man, doing the taxes. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, man. Listen. It, it, guys, it's it's a fucking sideshow. And if you have a, if you have a good sense of humor and you're chill and you just go with the flow, you can teach once in a while and you can actually like maybe do something where the kids value it and benefit from it. But sometimes you just got to go with the flow because if you try to change Vietnam, you're not going to. I assure you, you are not going to change. The <laughs> kids that want to learn English, they'll come up to your desk on break and they'll, they'll ask you mm -hmm. questions. You. Those are the kids that want to learn, and those are the kids that will do better when they get older. Uh, but there's only like four or five of them in a the class. Bro, I used to hide from the children, bro, between the breaks because it's just too much, man. Some of these schools, there's not like good TA teachers rooms where you can hide in, and like the kids right. are in the teacher's room, and it's like, man, I'm trying to chill out for five minutes where I don't hear screaming, where I don't hear constant screaming, and like I'm sitting here and I'm still hearing constant scream. So I started rocking the earplugs. So, you know, I would be teaching in the Englishes out of the book with the earplugs because, you know, I, it's not like I can hear anything anyway. He's got, he's got the earplugs right there. 
<laughs> so, so guys, it is an adventure. It's a crazy experience. And remember, if you're going to start a different experience in your life, you should have health insurance. So now it's time for a message from our sponsor, Safety Wing. One thing I've learned living as an expat for so many years is you will definitely get sick. And if it's your first time living in a developing country, I strongly recommend you have some reliable health insurance. That's why we partner with Safety Wing. Our link is in the description below. They're a health insurance company designed for nomads, designed for people who live the same lifestyle as us, who are out there actually living their lives and pursuing new opportunities and new destinations. Safety Wing is a great transitional health insurance until you can arrive in the country and figure out what you can get domestically. They're designed for people who move around and who travel, so it's the perfect health insurance for people who live our kind of lifestyle. You have tremendous lifestyle opportunities in these places. Don't let getting sick mess you up. Your first couple of years in a developing country, you will definitely, definitely get sick. And having a reliable health insurance can be the difference between spending thousands of dollars or coming away pretty clean. Anyway, guys, so uh, I, I definitely think that teaching is a, a fucking circus. Uh, this year, we've been able to help people without work, per, uh, without degrees, still get work permits this this school year. Um, Vietnam is becoming stricter as a country. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on that's kind of crazy. You know, they've had a lot of changes within government. They've moved their immigration system online. Some people it hasn't really affected. Other people it's created immense amounts of problems for. Um, I have some clients. It's crazy. I have a client right now who is still waiting for his TRC. And he's just been getting fucking shifted around and his time wasted. And he was the first out of the whole group of people to get their their work permit so he got his work permit before everybody we're like for sure he's going to be the first one done and everybody else got their trcs and is finished now and he's still sitting there for a month so just you could have a, a smooth experience or you could have a fucked up experience in this country and it's not even about working with good or bad people it's about whether or not the government bureaucrat that you get is gonna like even bother to do his job today or or he has a stack of 50 papers that he needs to stamp but he, but so, he doesn't want to stamp unless somebody pays him but everybody's Perfect. afraid to pay because of the fucking purges in the government right now and, and you know they don't know who's going to be the next one and you know there's this crazy situation with that woman who basically embezzled three billion dollars out of the vietnamese economy yeah yeah, yeah. they are sentenced her to death yeah. Well, yeah, uh, the Vietnamese and the, and the, the Chinese do. Sorry, it was a billion dollars over her time. She she had uh, LLCs. She was a ninety two percent get. She was doing loans for her bank, and she hired people to uh, just co sign all loans so she would get all the money. Yeah, she, the most ever, I think, in the world. They were saying. I mean, I don't know the statistics, but I I did see the headline where they said uh, 3% of Vietnamese a GDP she stole. That's crazy. That's I think crazy. I said something on, uh, I think but I guys, said it, 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 No, yeah, no, I have seen it. I've been following the situation. But guys, here here's the thing. It, it, it's kind of a, a mess because... Corruption exists literally at like every single level of Vietnamese society. So having the idea of an anti-corruption purge, it's like a little crazy because like literally the cop that's pulling you over and asking for bribes for your fucking license is robbing you. Like you don't think that this just goes all the way up? Like, I mean, and again, you know, it, it seems to me like trying to shoot goldfish, like, you know, you in, in a pot, you know, like you're, you no matter which way you shoot, you're going to hit somebody who did something wrong, you know? And it, it, it makes it really hard for things like bureaucracy, for like foreigners who want to invest, who want to bring money to the country, because you get these situations where one client gets pushed through and everything goes wonderfully. And then you get another one where the guy gets dicked around for six months to a year and it's harder than before to pay facilitation money. Before you could just pay somebody and they could sort it out. But now because of everything happening with the corruption stuff and everybody's dirty, so everybody's worried about it it makes it harder and harder to just like facilitate and you see the service companies are starting to go away. You see it's having, a, I guess, a good effect on some levels of corruption. Uh, but then you hear stories like this, like this, this billions of dollars just disappearing and fucking out of the Vietnamese. It's crazy. I mean, so, you know, you need to be aware and not be naive and be aware of where you're going and don't think of it like you're going to Canada or the U S uh, it's a developing country. The mindset is very different. The corruption and uh, scandal stuff will have effect on things like work permits, visas. 
I got a client a job at one of the bigger training centers because he really wanted to live in a training center, work in a training center and live in a, in a smaller province in the mountains. Uh, he had a, a you know, master's degree. So we were able to get him a, a fairly good job out there in, in the central highlands. And it, it, even that company, I'm not going to say their name because they're a larger brand uh, that took them almost six months to get him a work permit. So these situations right now with, with dealing with the government, this is one of the challenges. Um, but again, guys, nothing is nothing in life is perfect. You're going to get a very low cost of living. You're going to be able to save money. You're not going to have to work that much. You're going to have access, you know, even with or without paperwork. At some point, they're going to get you a work permit if they decide to keep you. So I think it's not the worst choice you can make. I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope this was some insight into the life of an English teacher. We're coming at it from not from the perspective of I'm an international school teacher at like the top tier schools. I taught in public schools, but I also taught in expensive training centers where it was one-on-ones with doctors and lawyers. And I also taught at shitty training centers that are basically run out of somebody's house. I taught in public schools that look like apartment buildings where they would load me in and then load the kids in behind me. And there was a trap door the teachers would exit through that led to a staircase that led to the front. So I've worked in all kinds of places and in Vietnam, and then I've worked helping people, you know, stay in Vietnam, get visas, find jobs, get off blacklists, get out of trouble. And uh, if you're thinking about coming out here, uh, message us. We do hourly consulting. We can help talk to you about the teaching business. Uh, uh, we like try to be authentic, but we do have legitimately large network of HR connections, as well as people for visas, setting up companies, pretty much anything you'd want to do in the country. And I think you guys can tell from my videos that I like to tell you the, the truth about the situation and not sugarcoat it. Pros, cons, there's good things, there's bad things. We're all adults. Uh, if you like to work with someone who has that kind of mindset, reach me on the Facebook fan page. Uh, or reach me on any of the social media in the description below. Uh, shout out to Uncle Hollywood. Please subscribe to his channel. He's small grassroots, just trying to get himself started. Just send him some love. You know, he's a good guy and he's just, you know, presenting his real experience living in Vietnam. Any last comments? I would just say, uh, don't be afraid. Take the step. And now is really the time to take that step because school is over. I'm hearing at the end of May this year. So then you'll have... Uh summer break and most people will be hiring again because it's hard to get teachers right now because of some of the laws uh so my only thing would say uh, if you're doing it now is the time to say i'm gonna do this uh, and it will make it easier for your transition and guys get with us because we can put you in that network and uh thank you for watching subscribe and share uh help us fight the algorithm we'll try to keep youtube authentic and honest we're not selling $2,000 Teffels. We're not presenting it like you're getting hired at a corporate job. We're not telling you that it's all sunshine and roses. So help us continue what we're doing by sharing the videos, liking the videos, subscribing, or getting with us for hourly consulting. Uh, if you want to donate, we have any. We have a bunch of links in below for like you know Patreon and you know anything you donate. Just shoot me a message. Tell me you did it, and uh, we'll announce you on one of the videos or you know, shout you out and show you love. Um, we do uh, expat relocation packages where we can set you up with contacts for employment, housing, visa services, jobs, setting up companies, you know, pretty much whatever you need. Uh, we can help you in other countries in Southeast Asia where we also have connections in the Balkans, Latin America, and uh, we're heading to India in a couple of weeks. So we're going to start having some connections in South Asia as well. And I think it's going to be very interesting to unlock this new challenge. So I hope you guys come along with us for that. Uh, we're going to be starting in Bengaluru, which is the IT Silicon Valley of India. And then we may be heading up to the yoga capital of India in the mountains, but we haven't made fixed plans yet. We'll let you know soon. Thank you for watching. Subscribe and share and uh, stay in school. Brush your face and wash your teeth, son. Hey, what's up? I'm Dee from Canada. Hook up with the New York Nomad if you want a smooth ride into Vietnam or any Southeast Asian countries. Hey, my name is Aaron. Get in contact with the New York Nomad. If you want to get into Vietnam, hit them up. They'll get you in securely and professionally. Yo, this is Uncle Hollywood. I'm telling you right now, the New York Nomad got me a job. He's legit. Hit him up. Check him out. New York Nomad set me up in Vietnam. <laughs> Yo, my man got me a job. Come to Vietnam.
Hey, what's up guys? You thinking about coming to Vietnam? You're not sure where to start? You've heard a lot of things online. You don't know what's true. You don't know what's not. We offer a consulting service where we help you get on your feet in Vietnam. We give you advice on negotiating contracts with employers. We help you with real estate agents, visa agents that are reliable and that you can trust. And we help you get started in this amazing country and get on your feet. We help you get into different opportunities that might be more difficult for you if you were just landing in the country on your own. And we help you avoid a lot of the, the pitfalls and problems problems that you could have as a newcomer here. We provide you with reliable job recruiters, visa agents, real estate agents, and advice. If you guys are thinking about coming to Vietnam, hit us up for a consultation. We'll help you get started, help you get on your feet, and hopefully you'll love Vietnam as much as we do.